this morning, without any further ado, we, uh, Jerry Thorpe contacted me some time ago, said he's going to be coming through here on Palm Sunday. And of course, I asked him if he'd stop and preach. I, I'm a privileged person to have known Jerry for the last 30 years. Uh, and he has been a good friend of mine, a good friend of my family. And he's been a good friend of the church that I pastored in Bozeman. We had him for 20 years in a row on the same date. Uh, and he was a blessing every single time. He's also been, of course, a friend to this church as well. Many of you know him. Uh, he's been here well, uh, probably almost annually for about 20 years. Some good about that, I think. Uh, some good that you can look and see someone who's continuing to minister and preach the word for that long. Uh, and again, he's been a good friend of this church. Pastor Almanzar was his youth director for a time, and that's the connection that, that brought him here. He's the one that, you know, I guess he's the one you should blame for me being here. Because when Pastor Almanzar told Jerry he's going to retire, Jerry called me. And uh, that sort of took us down that road. But I've always enjoyed hearing Jerry preach. He pastored in Odessa, Texas, for you who don't know, for over 30 years. Found the board of Liberty University and has preached all across the world. And has been one of the busiest retirement preachers I've ever met. In fact, I don't even want to be close to that. I don't think I'm that busy now. Uh, that Jerry has been in retirement. But he's going to come up here. He's going to preach for us on this Palm Sunday. Would you welcome him with me this morning? <clears throat> well, as I said to your guys yesterday morning, uh, I have spent all 86, almost 87 years of my life in the great state of Texas. So say howdy to me. Howdy. And don't let that be the last time you respond to what I'm saying this morning in case I stumble around and say something good. In just a moment, we're going to walk with sacred steps to a cross. But before we do, I want to give you a little bit of a commercial about tonight's message. This is not a Super Bowl quality commercial. It's just a preacher commercial trying to encourage you to do something probably most of you don't do, which is to come back on Sunday night. This morning's message is sacred. Tonight's is practical, very funny, lots of human, humanity of what we need to hear. It's a message on controlling your temper. Because we live in an angry world. We're angry about politics. We're angry in our schools. We're angry at our jobs. We're living in a world where people get angry, where they take a gun and go into a children's school in Nashville and just shoot it up because they're angry about something. And there's far too much anger in the American home. So from Ephesians 4, I'm going to give you six steps that the Apostle Paul said about controlling your temper. I'm just going to briefly give them to you. First of all, be ye angry and sin not. Anger's a warning light. Why are you so angry? Second point, don't let anger become your disposition. Don't be known as an angry person. Third, don't give the devil a foothold. The fourth thought is don't use words as a weapon in hurting other people. The fifth point is, don't ignore the coach because we grieve the Holy Spirit with our anger and we don't listen to the Holy Spirit when we're angry. And the last point is, anger is a choice. And I'm going to challenge you not to choose it. So I think it's one of the best messages I have. So as I said, it's very practical, very funny. I think it'll be helpful to you. I hope you'll be here tonight. Now this morning. Seven words from a bloody cross. In the next little bit, we're going to walk with hesitancy, reverence, humility, and gratitude to a hill shaped like a skull outside the city walls of Jerusalem where Jesus Christ died on a cross. The cross is more than decorations on your church building. It's more than jewelry we wear. It's more than old hymns we sing or some kind of a religious rabbit's foot. The cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection are the absolute center and the foundation of our faith. The apostle Paul said to the church of Galatia, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will not glory, save in the cross. The cross should never be ordinary in the life of a Christian. My dad, 
did not grow up in a, a Christian home, did not accept the Lord as a young man. He and mom married, dad was 26 years old. He was working in an oil field. He was a roustabout for you that are familiar with the oil patch in a little town called Cooper, New Mexico that's no longer there. He's 26 years old, he and mom, neither one are saved. He didn't even have a Bible. But just before I was born, my mom was over with her dad who's near the hospital. And dad crawled out on his knees beside his bed because of a mother's teaching about Jesus and accepted Jesus Christ as his savior. He's 26, <clears throat> he didn't even have a Bible. He was aroused about on an oil rig my dad told me one day, Freddie and I had traveled with he and mom uh, up through the Rockies, up in Canada, and, and uh, he was telling me about when he got saved, and he, I looked over and he was crying. And he said, son, when I got saved, I didn't even own a Bible. But he said, somebody on the rig where I work gave me a little New Testament. And he said, before I got saved, when the rig slowed down, I would gamble with the guys. But I didn't think that was right after I got saved, so I'd go over and sit on an oil barrel and read the Word of God. And my dad said, you know something, son? I couldn't read about the crucifixion of Christ without crying. See, I want us to be that kind of a person this morning, that when we go to the cross, it deeply touches our heart. Isaac Watts was an English congregational minister who wrote over 750 songs, songs, but one of his most beautiful is on your screen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. The story begins on what we celebrate today as Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday. It's the Sunday before Jesus died. Let's read it on your screen. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey with the coat and laid their clothes on them and set Jesus on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed he is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This was the, Jesus's last journey to the city of Jerusalem. If you remember in your Bible, when he, before he got to the city, he looked over the city and he wept over the city and their unbelief. He had come to Jerusalem to die, but he was constrained to make a final appeal to the sender of the nation to be accepted as the promised Messiah. This is the only public offering of Jesus as Messiah to the Jewish people when he rode in and presented himself as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to the city of Jerusalem. The thousands of people throughout Israel who had witnessed and been touched by his ministry, who were coming into Jerusalem for the Passover, welcomed him with praise, open arms, and palm branches in the streets. During the next few days, Jesus cleared the temple of the money changers, and he did the most amazing teaching. But the so-called religious leaders in Jerusalem were planning to arrest him, convict him in an overnight illegal trial, and sentenced him to die, which they did. From the time when Jesus was nailed to the cross at nine o'clock in the morning until he died at three o'clock in the afternoon, he spoke seven times. These words are so profound, church, that it shames me to even try to plumb the depths of these meanings. It amazes me first that he could speak at all. The physical, mental, and spiritual torture of what he had experienced over the last 36 hours is astounding. Jesus was up all of the previous day preparing with his disciples to eat the Last Supper. At that communion, 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, first knelt in humility and washed 12 pairs of the disciples' feet. And at the supper, he faced the betrayal of one of his disciples as Judas went out to sell him to the enemies for 30 pieces of silver. And at this supper, Jesus said, this is my body. He broke the bread and gave it to them. I, I, I want you to think in terms of Friday night at 630. Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them and said, when you eat this, I want you to remember this is my body, which is shed, broken for you. And then he gave the cup and they drank it. And he said, I want you to remember this is my blood, which was shed for you. I beg you to come Friday night, but don't take this casually. When you put the bread in your mouth, you remember he was broken for me. When you take the cup, he died with this bloodshed for me. And then he and the 11 disciples walked to the little garden of Gethsemane. There neath the old olive trees, which my wife and I had the privilege to stand in amazement one day, he agonized before God. Now you know the story, but I just want to give you some thoughts about it. He knelt beneath the old olive trees. He, took, he left eight of the disciples, took three with him. He left seven and took three, and then he knelt and agonized in prayer before God. First, he looked into the cup that he was about to suffer and he realized as a sinless person, all of the sins of all of mankind will be put upon him. And sometimes stop and give that some thought. If he just received the sins of all of this crowd, it would be an overwhelming, terrible thing. But the sins of the whole world upon him. Second, he knew the physical agony that he was going to suffer on the cross of the crucifixion. And third, for the first time in all eternity past and all eternity future, he would be separated from his father. As he looked into this cup of all of our sins, physical agony and separation from his father, and he prayed, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, it is not my will, but thy will. And no wonder, folks, sweat poured from his body as great drops of blood. And then they came in and arrested him. And sometime around midnight until dawn, he was tried before the Jewish Sanhedrin, as I said, which is an illegal trial. It was illegal in Israel to try somebody overnight on a capital offense. But they tried him. And listen closely, they found him guilty of blasphemy, of claiming to be God. Understand that. The one who was born of a virgin, who had power over nature and that he stilled the storm and turned water into wine. The one that had power over the animal world, that he could put a coin in a fish's mouth and bring multitudes of fish into Peter's boat. The one who had power over sickness and that he could heal lepers, open blind eyes, cure the paralyzed man. The one who had power over death to raise Lazarus and could even read the thoughts of man. That man, Jesus Christ, was accused of claiming to be God. The official charge was blasphemy. Then it was tried before the Romans under the control of both the horrid and sin-soaked King Herod and the troubled Pilate. And then he was scourged with a whip. I don't have time in this message, but sometime, if you want to understand fully what Jesus went through, understand what it would meant to be scourged by the Romans who were experts at giving torture and pain. A whip divided into several lengths with little pieces of bone and metal came across over and over and over, ripping, shredding the face, the back, the legs, the buttocks, all of the body ripped to shreds. Some were disemboweled, some died under the scourging. Jesus was scourged. And then Pilate sentenced him to die on a cross, so carrying his cross with thorns crowned of his head, 
until he stumbled under the weight of the cross and somebody helped him. And at the hill shaped like a skull, he laid down willingly on the cross. His robe was taken from him for men were crucified naked. You'll read Hebrews 12 verse two one day, which says he endured the cross despising the shame. Try to understand as best we can what that means. And then his hands were nailed, he was listed, and the cross beam was attached, and then his feet were nailed with long steel nails through the feet to the cross. And there he hung. He had been without food or water for at least 14 hours. He was covered with blood. He was fighting for every breath. Every bone in his body was out of joint. Every muscle was screaming with pain. Every pore crying of thirst. Insects and birds tearing at his flesh. The soldiers who nailed him were now gambling for his robe and he was watched by the eyes of the curious and some of his followers. Jesus began six hours of agony that none of us can describe or none of us can understand and then, after man had done his worst, our Savior spoke seven times. He first said the word of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Our first inclination would be, I must have misunderstood him. Surely his first word was a cry of condemnation or a plea for pity or hatred to the soldiers who were gambling for his robe. But no, it was a prayer of forgiveness. He said it to the crowd standing around the cross mocking him. He said it to the soldiers who nailed him to the cross. He said it to the thieves on either side. He said it to every person who ever lived. It's a petition from Jesus the Savior to his heavenly Father to not turn his face from me as a sinner Upon my confession and asking for a pardon to grant it and forgive their sins, he said it to all of us. When I was an 18-year-old boy kneeling at an altar, he said it to me, Father, forgive him. The second word was a word of salvation. It's on your screen. Then one of the criminals, one on either side, who were hanged blasphemed him. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, don't you even fear God, seeing we are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds. For this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, beautiful words, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, verily I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now this is no accident that this happened. 700 years before the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53 verse 12 said, he would be numbered with the transgressions, the transgressors. Uh, now, I believe this thief had heard of Jesus during his three and a half years of ministry. People were talking about the impact of Jesus to have mercy and be kind to the most hardened of criminals and sinners. Maybe he had heard of the woman at the well in Sychar, the crazed lunatic in Gadara, Zacchaeus in Jericho. Maybe he had heard the eternal life Jesus had promised to those who believed on him. And now he is nailed beside this one he had heard about and he's about to dry, to die and he cried for mercy and he received it. Now you could have questioned that thief. You could have said, wait, wait, wait. You can't be saved that easily after the horrid life you lived. And you can't even go to church. You can't be baptized. You can't read the scriptures. You can't even take communion. What makes you think that you can be saved when you die? And I think the thief would have said, I say that because the man in the middle cross said I could. 
What makes you think you can be saved? The man on the middle cross said I could. What makes you think you can go to heaven? The man on the middle cross said I could. Last soul, perhaps, I guess, Jesus won. Maybe the first was a f sophisticated Pharisee named Nicodemus. The last was a thief. But what an example, as I preached to your men yesterday morning, of our need to be constantly witnessing. I quoted them, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost to the sophisticated Pharisee, to a thief on the cross. May, may I use my dad again? My dad pastored the church. I was saved in that church, as I said, as an 18-year-old freshman in college. I'd gone up and joined the church with as I was a little guy with some other guys, but I never had peace with God, tried to just live on that and make, make something happen that wasn't real. Jesus was never real to me. But my dad was such a great man, and he was a great soul winner. And my dad's in his last days of life, he's dying. And I'm sitting beside my dad, and he's crying. And I'll never forget, he's, he's only a day, maybe two from dying. I remember he raised his little fist and he shook it. And he said, son, I wish I could win one more soul to Jesus before I die. I wish God would bring somebody by that I could witness to about Jesus. I guess it's funny, some girls, we had a very large church in Odessa and some girls ran a hospice, just started a new hospice and they just wanted to take care of dad. And they sent their chaplain by to visit dad, the hospice chaplain, and dad tried to win him to the Lord. Do you know you're saved? Do you know when you die you'd go to heaven? He had such a heart for that. Someone imagined the scene when the thief went to heaven. Seeing a crowd, he said, who are they? And they said, well, these are the writers of the Bible. And he said, I am not one of them. Well, who are these people over here? Said, that's the prophets, that's the disciples, that's the apostles. He said, I'm not one of them either. Who, who are these? Said, well, those are the longtime church members and attenders and Bible teachers. He said, I'm not one of them. He saw another crowd, he said, who are these? The angel said, those are just sinners saved by grace. And he said, I'm one of them. And I stand before you this morning and say, I'm one of them also, just a sinner saved by grace. What a great story. Third word is a word of affection. John 19, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, John, standing, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son, John will take care of you. Now we're not surprised to see Mary there, but being the mother of Jesus had not been easy. Did you ever give this thought? From the gossip surrounding his birth, do you like to have that story? She's engaged and she gets pregnant by the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> and the gospel said, you and Joseph been fooling around. No, 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 this is from God. You like to make that story palatable? She suffered the gossip surrounding his birth. King Herod tried to kill him. They fleed to Egypt. She had the episode when he was 12 years old and all the misunderstandings of his ministry all the way to him hanging on the cross, and she knew he was God. Simon, a holy man in Jerusalem at his birth, said to Mary, a sword will pierce your soul also. The one who first placed kisses on that brow that is now crowned with thorns. Probably now a widow, Joseph's never mentioned after Jesus was age 12. And Jesus is wrestling with the forces of hell. But he loved and took care of his mother. What a great example for all of us. Now the first three words were spoken in the first maybe hour. And then there's some long hours of darkness. And then the last words were spoken in the total blackness as God turned his face from his son 
as I said, I'm not worthy to walk here, but let's walk there together. Fourth is the word of anguish. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the only word from the cross in the original language. Jesus Christ is now at the lowest part of his ministry. And for the first time of all of our readings in the gospel, every time Jesus addressed his father, it was always my father. He taught us to pray our father which is in heaven. But for the first time on the cross, Jesus does not refer to him as his father. He said, my God, my God. Frederick Krumacher died in 1796, wrote a book called The Suffering Savior that I read years ago. And he said, God forsaken by God, who can understand that? But he's paying my sin debt. If he's paying what Jerry Thorpe deserved, which is separation from God in hell, if he's going to suffer, if he's going to suffer that and take my place, then Jesus must suffer everything I owe God. He must suffer my hell. He must be separated from his father as I would have been in hell. So God blackened the earth from the sun for three hours and hid his presence from his son. And that terrible darkness is on the only time in all of eternity past, of all eternity future, that God the Father and God the Son were separated. On your screen, for he made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now I'm gonna go another step further than what I am able to speak. But how many of you men in here have a son? What would it take for you to turn your back on your son? If your son was in an accident, on a battlefield, in a fight or a disease, could you turn your back on your son? No, a thousand times no, but God did for me and for you. Remember singing at church, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Fifth word, a word of suffering. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, just said, I thirst. Any military person, and I listen to my friend Steve preach almost every week. And I remember one week you had a couple of your men from the church who were veterans, military men. It must have been on Veterans Day, did a very impressive presentation. Any military person could tell you that the loss of blood brings on the most terrible thirst. And Jesus on the cross, just picture this. The Son of God said, I thirst. In his deity, Jesus had made and controlled every drop of water on this earth. He could have commanded any cloud to bring cooling rain to fall on his parched face in life. He could have called 10,000 angels to rip out the nails and heal his wounds, but he did not. The rich man in hell said, please send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Jesus cried, I thirst. Let me give you another thought here. Maybe this is more than a physical thirst. King David said in Psalms 42 two, my soul thirst for God. Do you suppose maybe Jesus on the cross for the first time separated from his father, thirsted for water, but maybe more, I thirst for God, my father. Sixth word, a word of victory. 
Jesus received the sour wine and he said, it is finished. It's a declaration from Jesus Christ that everything he came from heaven to earth to do was done. Our price for salvation has been paid. I didn't pay it. You didn't pay it. Jesus paid it. All the prophecies about his life and death were fulfilled. All the sufferings have been finished. The payment for sin is finished. I read a story about an eccentric English evangelist named Ebenezer Wooten who was taking down his tent following a meeting when an earnest young man ran and said, Brother Wooten, what must I do to be saved? And the evangelist said, my friend, you are too late. And the young man, oh, don't say that, Mr. Wooten. Surely it is not too late because the meeting is over. Yes, he said, it is too late. You wanted to know what you must do to be saved. And I tell you, you are 2,000 years too late. The work of salvation is done. It's finished. It's complete. It was finished on the cross. You can't do anything to be saved. All you can do is accept it. Last words. The word of contentment. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Here again, I'm in deeper water than I'm able to understand or appreciate. But what a beautiful statement. Father, into your hands. I have suffered. I have paid the penalty. I have paid the cross. Now I give myself to your hands. Let me tell you guys something. Jesus was not face to face with death. Jesus was face to face with his father. What a great way to die. I'm 86 years old, two, mo two more months I'll be 87. I know I'm not going on forever. And if you come around, you say, Jerry's face to face with death. No, he's not. I'm gonna be face to face with my father. Face to face with my father. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. There was an English preacher named Charles Berry. He came from England and pastored later the great Plymouth Church in Brooklyn. And one day he described how he came to know Jesus Christ. He said, when I became a minister, uh, I preached a very thin gospel, really no gospel at all. I didn't look upon Jesus as a divine redeemer, but I described him as merely a noble teacher who came to show us how to live. And he said, late one night in England in my first pastorate, I was sitting in my cozy study and there came a knock on the door. And when I opened the door, there was a, a very young, typical Lancashire girl with a shawl over her head and clogs on her feet. And she said, are you a minister? And he said, yes, then you must come with me quickly I want to get my mother in. Well, thinking it was a case of some drunken mother out on the streets, Barry said, you must get a policeman. And the young girl said, no, my mother is dying and you must come and get her into heaven. Barry got his coat and followed her for a mile and a half through the lonely streets in the night. And then he knelt at this woman's side and he began to tell her how good and kind Jesus was and how he'd come to show us how to live. And the desperate woman cut him off. Mister, that's no use for the likes of me. I'm a sinner. I've lived my life. Could you tell me of someone who could have mercy on me and save my poor soul? 
I stood there in the presence of that dying woman, said Barry, and I realized I had nothing to tell her. In the midst of sin and death, I had no message. So in order to bring something to that dying woman, I leap back to my mother's knee. I leap back to my cradled faith. And I told her the story my mother had told me that I had never accepted. The story of the cross and of a Christ who was able to save us to the uttermost. I told her about God who gave his son who died on the cross that you could be saved. And the tears began to run down the woman's cheek. Now you're getting it, she said. Now you're helping me. And Barry concluded the story by saying, I got her in and blessed be God, I got in myself. Praise God. That's what happened to me as an 18-year-old young man. I was already a member of the church. I'd been baptized, but I didn't have Jesus. But that night, I got in myself. I'm a, just a guest here. I take advantage of nothing. But I tell you how I'd like to close this service. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and a pianist is gonna play. I wanna ask you, how long has it been since you were in church and publicly you thank the Lord for dying for you? You thank the Lord for what we've preached about this morning. I'd like to ask you, would you like to take a moment to walk publicly? There's lots of room here and at the altar. If you can kneel, if you wanna stand, but just come and spend a few moments between you and God and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for everything you've done for me. And here this morning, if you're like Jerry Thorpe, you've messed around with religion, but it's not real. Jesus is not real. Why don't you say this morning, I'm gonna get in today. I'm gonna get in today. Steve, the pastor, will be here at the front. I want you to come to him. You find him and just say, preacher, I want you to help me. The night I got saved, I was singing in the choir. I sang a very high bass in the choir. And I made my night, that we had a youth deal before church, I made my mind up in the youth mind. I was tired of the way I was living, I was tired of not having peace, and I made up my mind I was gonna settle it that night. And when the invitation came, I was the first one down, and my dad kneeled beside me and I said, Dad, I'm leaving a lie. Jesus Christ is not real to me, I've never been saved. And that night, the Lord changed my life. If that's you this morning, and you don't have peace with God, I want you to come up and just say, preacher, I need to be saved. So she's gonna play softly. And I just want you to come and stand or kneel and thank Jesus Christ for what he's done for you. Would you stand together? And I'm gonna pray, but as I'm praying, I'd like for you to come from all over the building. Would you come and thank Jesus Christ for what he's done for you? Would you do it? Father, bless us this morning. Give us hearts of gratitude Dear Father, for what you've done for us. We take so much for granted. God, forgive us. Forgive us. And I thank you tonight for saving me and these wonderful people. May we come and kneel and stand in your presence and say, Dear Father in heaven above, thank you for saving me.